fire up there to my king gun. Go high, low, low, right there. There you got it. We're here at the Cavalry Museum in the Netherlands looking at one of the great oddball might have beens of World War II. This is Canada's first real tank. This right here is the Ram tank. And we'll get to what this is doing in a Netherlands museum in a minute. But in 1940 and 1941, the Canadians have a problem. They want tanks. They're building their own armored divisions and they need armored vehicles to use. But they can't go to the British. The British are busy after Dunkirk, desperately trying to build their own tanks. They simply can't afford to give the Canadians any. And even if they do choose to build British designs in Canada, they'll still need British engines and other British parts. Canadian industry just isn't that good yet. And so there's a third option, and this is what they choose to go with. They're going to build American tanks using American parts, fabricating and assembling what they can in Canada. But this opens up another problem, because as you might know, American tanks of this period just aren't very good. The best the U.S. has to offer is the M3, the Lee. And the Canadians take one look at the Lee, and they dislike a lot of the things that most people dislike about the Lee. They don't like that it's so dang tall. They don't like that it has that weird sponson-mounted side gun with a limited field of fire. They don't like the fact that it has a big six or seven man crew. They want something that's a little bit smaller and something that actually has a proper turret. And since nothing like that's on the market, they decide that they're going to design and build their own tank. Now, it's difficult to build a tank from scratch, and so the Canadians kind of meet the problem halfway. They take the parts of the Lee that they like. They like the engine, they like the transmission, they like the tracks, and they like the suspension. So they take the chassis of the Lee, and they build their own upper hull, and they build, most importantly, their own turret. And when you take a look at the Ram, you can pretty clearly see where the Lee part ends and can the Canadian part begins. You have, of course, the classic double pin rubber and steel tracks. You have the classic VVSS suspension. You have the, unrec the recognizable Lee transmission case right here. But as you go up, you start running into more and more parts. Obviously, here is the cast hole. And this is the largest cast hole the Canadians have ever made. And it's actually a pretty good piece of armor. It's up to three inches thick in places. And when you remember that the Lee had only about two inches of armor in many places, it's actually quite a bit more heavily armored than its peers. But also, it has some interesting little oddball features. You can see right here, this is one of the distinctive features of early Ram tanks. And what the Canadians did is they took the turret, or the little cupola on top of the Lee, and they took that and they moved it right here. And this is a feature they sort of steal from the British. A lot of British tanks of this period, particularly cruiser tanks, have these small little secondary turrets right here in the hole of the tank. Great example of this is the Crusader that has a small turret right here. And this turret can fit a Browning 1919 or two Browns. Uh, but pretty quickly the Canadians realize this is a dumb idea. It's small, it's cramped, the gunner can't see very much, and they end up going with a more traditional ball and socket mount for a machine gun in the hole. But the early Mark IIs have it, and this is an early Mark II. That's how you can tell. Moving up, though, is probably the most distinctive feature of the Ram tank, and that's the fact it's got a turret. A turret that can go 360 degrees, which is much, much better than the Lee. And these fit a variety of different guns. Uh, because of production bottlenecks, the early Ram tanks don't get the bigger guns the Canadians want. They have to make do with the little 2-pounder, 40-millimeter pop guns. The early Mark I's have that. And the Mark II's, like this one, get the guns the Canadians actually want. What they want is the quick-firing 6-pounder, a 57-millimeter high-velocity anti-tank gun. This is the classic British anti-tank gun of the war. And it's reasonably good at knocking out tanks. Now, it seems a little bit odd the Canadians would choose to do this. I mean, after all, the Americans do have the M2 and later the M3 70mm guns. This is what you see on the Lee and later the Sherman. Th these guns were available. So why don't the Canadians go with this? Well, they wanted to kill tanks. And at the time, with the armor-piercing shells they had, the 57mm had a little bit better armor-piercing performance. So they went with that. But as the war went on, they realized that the 57 millimeter wasn't cutting it. And a lot of the older Ram tanks later in the war do get the bigger 75 millimeters. Now, 
There is one problem though with all of this, is that as the RAMs are starting to be made in 41 and 42, they're obsolete pretty quickly. The Sherman tanks start hitting the production lines, and the Sherman is better in pretty much every single way. It's a little bit faster, it's got a bigger gun, and it's got better armor. And so the Canadians pretty quickly realized that if you're going to go into combat, you don't want to use one of these. You can use a Sherman. And so of the 2,100 of these that are built, none of the gun tanks like this one actually see combat. They're all relegated to training use in Canada and Great Britain. But the, the Ram tank does have a life afterwards. A huge number of variants of this tank are made. There's a flamethrower variant that's used in Holland in 1940. There's a version of this that's used for artillery observation posts that has a dummy gun fit on it. These are often used by Canadian artillery units. They even take a version where they strip the turret and the upper hole off, and they add a 25-pounder artillery piece, and this becomes the Sexton Mark II, one of the most widely used Canadian self-propelled guns of the war. There's an ammunition carrying variant that's used. They even have one where they take the turret off, fit a small machine gun, and cram infantry inside. This is, of course, the famous kangaroo version. So even though the Ram gun tank doesn't actually see battle, its variants end up having a very long and very productive service life. And after the war is over, a lot of these Rams end up getting a second lease on life. After the war, the Netherlands army needs tanks. And although they're able to get their hands in a few Shermans, there just aren't enough to go around. And so the British are grateful enough to give them a few of these uh, ram tanks that have been sitting in depots for years and years and years and haven't been maintained or taken care of all that well. But still, one tank is better than no tank at all. And so this is sort of the nucleus of the new Netherlands armored force after the war. And the Netherlands tankers don't really like them all that much. The Dutch tankers find they're unreliable, they haven't been taken care of, and they're pretty clearly obsolete. They were obsolete at the beginning of the war. They're definitely obsolete in 1945 and 1946. So as time goes on, they're phased out. And a lot of them end up being buried in concrete and used as pillboxes. But a few do survive. And so we're lucky enough to have this one right here. This is one of the last ram tanks anywhere in the world. And it's an interesting little quirk of history that this oddball, scrappy Canadian tank has managed to stay in one piece for all this time. And it's an interesting memento of history.